I've been told that Australians are even more outgoing than Americans. And I, I realize that not everybody in the room is Australian, but we are in Brisbane. So let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Ah, much better. OK. Um, I, I want to thank uh, both Kenneth and Tauna for doing a great setup to uh, the presentation that I'm going to be going through, because I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive on ABB ability. Um, hopefully enough to give you a kind of level of understanding that you can then take with you to the other sessions, to the solution showcase, to the discussions that you're going to have uh, during the next couple days here. Um, but I, I'll start off actually by just revisiting this uh, concept of digitalization. And I mean, we are here, and this is called the Digital Transformation Summit. Um, and you know, you're going to hear the word digital in various shapes, forms, guises. So I thought I'd, I'd maybe start with just talking about kind of how I see the different ways of um, uh, that the digital transformation is taking place. So the first one is you've, you've heard the term digitization, right? What does that mean? Well, to me, what that means is you're taking information in analog form, could be text, could be photos, uh, could be voice. It could be readings taken off of an analog gauge on a piece of equipment. And you're converting that to a digital format so that you can store it, you can process it, you can transmit it digitally. We've been doing this for decades, and we will continue to do that with information. Uh, and there's clear benefits from digitizing information. Um, things like just elimination of paperwork, um, uh, reducing the number of errors from rekeying in information. But that's not the same as digitalization. So when we talk about digitalization, what we're talking about is changing a business model that creates new value or new revenue opportunities that didn't exist previously. So it's much more of a transformation in the sense that the business is changing. Now, some of you know that in a past life, um, I was an industry analyst. Um, I worked for two of the big uh, technology industry analyst firms, Gartner and IDC. Uh, and when I was with IDC, I worked with a guy named Frank Jens. Uh, and this is his latest, one of his latest predictions relative to di digitalization. So what, what Frank said is that by 2020, 50%, half of the global 2000 companies will see a majority of their business depend on their ability to create digitally enhanced products, services, and experiences. So it's a pretty bold statement. He went on to, to kind of try to quantify that and say that worldwide investment in these digitalization initiatives will reach $2.2 trillion in 2019. That's 60% more than 2016. I think that that kind of correlates back to one of the slides that Tano put up about the, uh, the, the opportunity for value creation, in, also in the trillions of dollars. So we're not, we're not talking about small amounts of value here. We're talking about very, very large amounts of value. Kenneth did a great job of giving some personal examples of digitalization, how they've impacted him. And I've, I've got a couple more. Um, interestingly, most of the examples that get used either in articles or presentations like this are on the kind of consumer side of the market. But we'll get to kind of where that's leading in just a minute. Um, Starwood Hotel Group, and I, I, I feel bad using this example because we're in a Hilton, which is not a Starwood Hotel, but it's a great example because they rolled out last year uh, an offering called SPG Keyless. 
And what it basically lets you do is that you can use the app on your mobile phone to check into your hotel before you arrive, and then use your smartphone as the key to enter your room. So you can bypass the reception desk ent entirely. You can check in, go up to your room, get into it with your, with your smartphone. You've, you've, they've, they're basically transforming the experience of a guest staying at a hotel. And they couldn't do that unless they had digitalized that, that process. Um, another example that I like is one of the manufacturers of tennis rackets, Babolat. Um, they introduced their Play connected tennis racket. Um, it's got sensors built into it, things like accelerometers, uh, and it has a, a communications capability so that as you're playing, it's collecting information. After you're done, you can analyze your game and look for ways to improve. It's pretty cool stuff. Now we're starting to move into kind of still consumer, but energy consumer. And this kind of relates once again back to kind of what some of the things that, that Kenneth was talking about. Um, British Gas introduced what they called Hive Active Heating. Um, it's essentially a smart thermostat. It's like the Nest thermostat um, that collects data on kind of how you are heating your home, what your preferences are, um, you know, when you, w w when you typically turn the heating on, turn the heating off, um, and does analytics on it, and then lets British Gas, as a retailer, suggest settings that meet kind of your goals. If, you, if your goal is to spend the least amount of money, they can suggest a, a scheme that will get you there. If, you're, if, it, if it's maximizing comfort, they've got a different scheme for that. So it's moving British Gas towards this idea of selling heating as a service. Right? So we're starting now to see this transition from kind of pure um, consumer-oriented digitalization initiatives creeping into the industries that, that we all play in. I'll talk a little bit more about kind of how this has happened over time uh, and what that means for us uh, he, here representing you know, the industries that are represented here in the room. Um, back when I started my career in the tech industry, and this was when dinosaurs were roaming the earth, um, innovation, it wasn't even called innovation back then, it was called invention, um, but technology innovation was really primarily coming out of large government labs or large corporate labs like Bell Labs, the famous Bell Labs in New Jersey. And, and there was this kind of tipping point where things started to change. And that happened right around the late 70s, early 80s. And I'd like to point to the example of a specific um, organization. It was Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC. And um, that research institute came up with a lot of innovations that, that we just take for granted today, things like the graphical user interface, the computer mouse. Well, somewhere around 1979, 1980, Steve Jobs visited Xerox PARC, saw what they were doing, and about four years later, introduced the first Macintosh personal computer. The Macintosh at the time was not targeted towards business users. It was targeted towards consumers. So we started to see a shift of technology innovation from kind of large kind of government or corporate labs applied to things like the space program or you know, kind of big um, either government or, or, or corporate um, initiatives and shifting over to the consumer markets. So now we've, we're in this mode where we've seen all this innovation come out in first in consumer markets, right? Smartphones, um, the mobile internet, um, you know, all, all these, the, these uh, social media, all these innovations that now are coming back into industrial markets. So interesting shift. And, and the ability then to take these innovations that have been happening in consumer markets and apply them to industrial markets is where that potential value creation occurs. This is a slide that Tano already put up. And it basically just says, just look at this list of different um, 
technology innovation. And based on this study that, uh, that he mentioned that McKinsey did jointly with ABB, it looks, like, it looks at the potential for creating value in industrial markets based on those technologies. And value, is, in this case, is measured by either productivity improvement or cost reduction. So it's actually measurable, potentially measurable value creation. The other thing that ABB did jointly with McKinsey was then to look at the time frame for how this was going to play out across different industry segments. So what you see here is this S-curve. And over on the right -hand, upper right-hand side are industries that are already well into their digital transformations. So not surprisingly, the IT industry, the communications industry, is, is the furthest one out uh, to the right there. Um, the media industry, going from basically um, print media to digital media, that has mostly already occurred. Uh, financial services, um, you know, uh, online banking, mobile banking, we're well into that. But now you see, down in the middle, the markets that ABB typically sells to, the industrial markets, and those are highlighted in that kind of dark gray color. And then in particular, I highlighted in red the industries that are primarily represented here at the event, utilities, transportation, mining. Those are all right at the cusp. They're right at the beginning of this journey, this tra digital transformation journey, and are really now starting to focus on how do they create value by digitalization. And uh, I think a great example is that later today, you're going to hear a presentation by John McGaugh from Snowy Hydro. John's title is Chief Digital Officer. So we now have chief digital officers that are responsible for shepherding their organizations through this digital transformation in these industrial markets. Snowy Hydro is an energy company. The, the other thing, in case you don't know, is that ABB has a chief digital officer. His name is Guido Jure. He joined us about a year ago, and he's responsible for shepherding ABB's offerings, our products and services, through this digital transformation. So let's talk a little bit now more about wh why, why is ABB well positioned in this market? And it's primarily around the expertise that we have as a company. You start with the fact that we have an installed base of products of $400 billion. So huge install base of products that are deployed in the field. And we have this knowledge, this understanding, this expertise about how those products work in various um, environments, uh, supporting various processes. So we've got all that, that, that knowledge and expertise. We have tremendous amount of expertise around the relevant technologies, whether it's power technologies, materials science, um, or digital technologies like software, which is one of the reasons we're all, we're all here. Just take a look at the product group that I represent, Enterprise Software. We continue to invest greater than 20% of our revenues every year back into R&D. So continuous investment in digital technology. And then finally, just know-how about the industries we serve in the geographies that, that the customers are located in um, and, uh, and the processes. So as an example, understanding the asset management process within a particular industry like the mining industry or the utilities industry um, and the implications for digital transformation on those processes. And that's where, you realize I've been talking for what, like 10, 15 minutes. I haven't even really talked about ABB Ability yet. Um, that's where ABB Ability really comes in. So at, at its most basic level, 
what ABB ability does is it enables us as ABB to take all that expertise and deliver it through digital offerings to our customers. That's really what it's all about. Um, you also saw, Tano, put this, this, uh, this slide up there, and I'm just going to talk a little bit more about it. So when we say ABB ability, what we're talking about is how do you stitch together a whole range of technologies to deliver one of these di digital solutions to a customer. So starting at the bottom of that, of that pyramid, you've got smart devices, sensors, um, actuators, um, that, that are digital and that communicate. So it could be a digital relay in a substation, it could be an RTU, it could be one of our core sense sensors that work with power transformers, it could be one of our smart sensors for motors, um, it, it, it could be any number of smart devices that, that are connected and, and are providing information in, in, in bi-directionally up to the upper layers. So the next layer on that, on that pyramid is automation systems, something we've been doing for decades, whether it's the 800, 800XA system that gets used in mining, or Symphony Plus, which, get, which gets used in power generation, or the water industry, or Network Manager, which is used in power transmission and distribution, as well as rail. But you've got that, that automation layer, and then you go up to the enterprise or plant level, and you've got software products that we've been delivering, once again, for a long time. It could be Ellipse, it could be Mind Market, it could be Service Suite, any Asset Suite, any of those uh, software products. And then finally, at the very top, is, are the cloud-based offerings. And how do you then deploy digital offerings in the cloud. And a good example, which you can see in the solution showcase, would be an asset health center. Um, taking information all the way from the bottom of the, the pyramid, from sensors in, let's say, a substation, all the way up through the automation systems, the substation automation systems, the EAM systems, and then finally, the analytics in the cloud. So it's kind of stitching all of that together in a seamless solution. There's two aspects to ABB ability if you think about kind of now starting to think about kind of the underlying technology. There's, there's the solutions at the top, which I just talked about. How do you kind of stitch all this, this, this technology together? And then there's the platform aspect. And um, a lot of the questions that, that I get relate to, well, what is this, this platform? Well, it's a, it's a common set of technologies and standards that we are now using across ABB that makes it easier for us to integrate or stitch together all of those digital solutions. And after I'm done, um, Kevin O'Leary, my colleague who's responsible for, for R&D for enterprise software, is gonna talk about our partner, partnership with Microsoft and then you'll actually hear from Microsoft themselves. Um, but one of our key technology partners for ABB Ability is Microsoft. Many of the capabilities in that platform are built on the Microsoft Azure technology stack. Um, and kind of lucky for me as the head of product management for enterprise software, we started doing software development on Microsoft Azure a couple of years ago. So we're actually kind of ahead of the curve and the ABB Ability team is taking a lot of input from what we've learned over the last couple years in de you know, developing and deploying software solutions uh, on Microsoft Azure. Just an ex as an example, um, and this is not an exhaustive list, these are just some of the, the products that you'll see here in the solution showcase. Um, we, we've been working to take Ellipse and move it to the cloud. We've done that in a stepwise fashion. So we have some modules of Ellipse that are already cloud-only options. 
things like the analytics bundle and the mobile SaaS apps. And now we have the ability to actually deploy Ellipse in the cloud on the Azure platform. So we've been working on that. So some of, the, some of the work has been taking existing products and moving them to the Ability platform. In other instances, we're start, we started basically from scratch and built cloud-first applications. So Asset Health Center is a good example of that. Our new uh, ABB Ability Workforce Management offering is being built as a cloud-first offering. Now, that's not to say that we expect everything to be 100% in the cloud, because that, that's not going to happen, at least in my tenure here. Um, it, it's, it's going to be, for the foreseeable future, a hybrid environment. We'll talk a bit more about that. But you can see that we're moving towards this common technology platform that allows you to do things both on-premise and in the cloud and take advantages of the, the capabilities in both of those realms. Um, Tano also put this up there. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time reiterating what he already said. Um, I just want to point out a couple, couple things that, that are probably new to you. Um, one is distributed energy resource management. Um, there, are, there are places around the world, and Australia happens to be one of those places, where the penetration of distributed energy resources on the grid is reaching a point where it's problematic for distribution utilities, distribution system operators, to maintain reliability, power quality, safety, with that high level of, of penetration of, of distributed energy resources on their distribution networks. So they need a technology or digital solution to help them manage that situation. Um, so we are in the process of developing a distributed energy resource management solution based on our advanced DMS or distribution management system and leveraging some technology from a partner, a company called Inbala, that we put an um, equity investment into just this, uh, earlier this year. And we'll be bringing that to market in the fourth quarter of this year. Um, the other one I want to uh, talk about is the mobile uh, or field workforce management. Um, some of you here uh, are familiar with our Service Suite product, which is widely deployed and used for mobile workforce management. Um, we are in the process of developing a cloud-first offering that offers capabilities beyond what you can have traditionally been able to do with Service Suite and kind of complements. So you've got kind of Service Suite as your on-prem option. You've got the new offering as your cloud-based off, uh, offering, and the two of them will, will be able to interoperate together. Um, and just as, a, just as an example, I, I think uh, we'll be showing some, uh, out here in the Solution Showcase what you can kind of leverage in the cloud. For instance, the ability to have a headset that has a noise-canceling microphone and then talk to a chat bot that's sitting in the cloud that you can do inspections with voice commands and have a conversation that's entering information, capturing information, and guiding the technician through the inspection process. Um, in, in industry, once again, I, I would point out, we, 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 we put kind of cybersecurity assessments on the industry slide. It actually applies across all of the markets we serve. Um, and you probably don't realize kind of behind the scenes how much investment ABB puts into making sure that its products are cyber secure before we deploy them to customers. And, and I'll talk a bit more about that as well. On the left, it's a great term, fog computing. I did not come up with that term, so don't blame me. Um, this is what we've been doing with, with auto, automation control systems for, for, for a long time. It basically says you've got intelligent devices that are collecting for data, um, performing functions, and you've got some on-premise technology applications that are controlling them. And they call it FOG because unlike the cloud, it's kind of close to the ground, right? Well, I talked about this transition to cloud. In the middle, that's where we're all headed. These 
this install base of systems is not going to go away anytime soon. What we have to figure out is how do you provide connectivity up to the cloud to take advantage of some of the things that are available that I talked about, like the chat bot or like analytics in the cloud or, or any of those capabilities. So for the foreseeable future, our focus is going to be on this hybrid environment. And that's kind of the basis of ABV Ability is the assumption that it's not all cloud, it's not all on-premise, it's a, it's a hybrid environment of the two. And then over on the right, we also get a lot of questions about, well, you guys have got ABB Ability, GE has got Predicts, you know, there's all these cloud platforms or IoT platforms out there, you know, aren't they all just proprietary? And the, the answer is that what one of the, also the, the kind of the tenets of ABB Ability is the ability to interoperate with other vendors' IoT offerings as well. Um, and, and a lot of the design that's gone into the ABB Ability platform is based on that, that kind of you know, basic design principle that it can't stand alone, it has to interoperate. Um, this is where I talk about cybersecurity. So there are a whole set of cybersecurity standards that we apply to our offerings to ensure that, as I said, you know, that they are cybersecure, that they meet all the, 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 the required standards, they've gone through all the testing, the certification, before we deploy them to a customer. And then services that are, could be cybersecurity assessments, they could be monitoring services, um, patch management, basically all a whole portfolio of services that address the issue of cybersecurity. But two things in addition to cybersecurity that are really important when you start deploying offerings in the cloud, um, one is who owns the data? Well, I mean, our position is the customer owns the data. It's customer's data, they own it. But we have to find a way to ensure that that's reality and not just a statement. Um, and then the second one is intellectual property. Um, once you're deploying things in the cloud, there's questions about who owns the intellectual property rights. So once again, ABB is working on what we call a data manifesto that we're putting out there as open source in the industry to address these two additional issues. And finally, you notice I haven't really had an architecture diagram up here until the very end. Um, and that was on purpose. But since everybody asks, this is kind of at a high level what kind of the, the ABB ability architecture looks like. And it's just a kind of fancier version of that pyramid that I showed you, right? So at the bottom, you've got the devices, you've got distributed analytics and control at that level. You've got gateways that provide connectivity as you kind of move up the layers to the automation layer, to the enterprise layer. And then <clears throat> sitting in the cloud, you've got your, your basic kind of security, connectivity, management, uh, functions, the ability to deploy applications in the cloud, um, and there's, there, there's infrastructure functions up there. So this is just kind of the snapshot of what that ability architecture looks like. So I'm going to wrap up with one more thing. You've heard uh, a little bit uh, about digital substations, the um, fact that, that PowerLink Queensland was actually one of the very first, if not the first, to deploy a digital substation. Um, this is a great example of how this all comes together. So in a digital substation, you have a number of um, uh, devices, automation, uh, sensors, et cetera, that are associated with the primary equipment in that substation, transformers, circuit breakers. You've got then secondary control protection equipment, relays, micro SCADA systems associated with that substation. And now, what we're starting to do is deploy connectivity from the substation automation systems so that you can take information out of the data historian associated with that substation, bring it up to the cloud, use Asset Health Center to analyze the health of the primary equipment in that substation, predict the potential for failure of that equipment, then communicate that to your 
enterprise asset management system to Ellipse as an example so that you can create a work order that's going to generate a dispatch of a technician through a mobile workforce management system. Technician's going to go perform whatever work is prescribed on that piece of equipment and then update the information and change the health score of, of the piece of equipment. So we've tied together once again, stitched together a digital solution that changes the way the business process for managing the assets in that substation.